talk about something that is so common, but it absolutely is essential to what we do, and that's prayer. I've spoken on prayer many times, but I find the things that I know and the things that I teach on are the things that can elude us, and we can use prayer, or we can start becoming very formulaic pray before a meal, pray before we have church, pray before we do certain things, which are all good. But prayer is really about a relationship with God. Corey Ten Boom was a survivor of the Holocaust, and she had this to say, any concern too small to be turned into prayer is too small to be turned into a burden. So many little, the little foxes that spoil the vine, the little things that get to you, I know what they are. It's like, it's like a sibling that can tease you and get you like nobody else. When I was a brand new Christian, I felt so spiritual. I'd come home to my family. He said, oh, you're just like you always were. I said, no, I'm not. I've changed. Apparently, they didn't see it. <laughs> and we want to make this, there's so many little things encumbrance it so easily beset us. And she said, if they, if, if they do, then pray for it. If you lose the phone, pray to find it. If you lose your keys, pray to find it. If you're late, pray that people will have mercy. Pray, but bring prayer into all that you do, all that we do. She also said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? I told the story in Africa when Dudley and I were <clears throat> there years ago, and we were in a Jeep safari. We'd already done ministry and stuff, and this was kind of like a bonus time with two other couples, and all I wanted to do was see a lion, and uh, we'd seen everything under the sun, but the, the driver assured us we'd see a lion, and then we're, it was coming towards the end of the day. He goes, lion, lion, and I go, let's go, and so he cranks it up, and he's hauling ice. I see this lion, and I know why they're the king of the jungle. They walk, their shoulders are like that. They look like the best running back you've ever seen. Uh, they're studs. And he's walking. It was a couple hundred yards away, but we went towards him, and he went that way. So he's tearing it. He gets down, and uh, we go into a thing called black tar. 
Black tar is the thickest mud you can imagine. It's like glue. And he kicks the Jeep, which has four wheels. It's made for this kind of stuff, and it's stuck. And we are sitting there in the middle of lion country. He said there was a pride of 40 lions, 50 lions there last week. And, we did, and then there was this hippo about 200 yards away in a little pond. And his ears were twitching as he looked at us. And we, the driver didn't know what to do. He called, and they wouldn't come for help. He said, because we'll get stuck too. They had got, the, there was a couple weeks prior, they got people out with a helicopter. So we're there. We get out of the Jeep, and um, Dudley and I, John and Leighton Isaacs, and Harmon and Terry Parker. Harmon does the bridges. He builds bridges in Africa. He's been doing it for 30 years. He's a CNN hero. He's an amazing guy. So we're there, and, and Harmon says, well, I'm not so concerned about the lions, he said, uh, I've actually had two or three of my helpers killed, maybe three helpers over the 30 years from Cape Buffalo. They, they hide in the bush, and then they come out, and they'll just attack. You don't even see them, and then you're, you're history. Thank you, Harmon, for that encouraging word. <laughs> so anyway, we get out there, and John, John is the practical. John gets, and I am too. We're trying to, okay, we, we look for weeds and on the ground, and we're looking around for lions, and putting it behind the tires. I had an extra t-shirt, took it off, put it under the tire. I said, go ahead. <laughs> Nothing. I thought it was going to burn the engine out. And then uh, we kept doing that, and we were into it about, I don't know how long, probably 30 minutes. And Dudley says, don't you think we should pray? <laughs> OK. Let's get the prayer over with so we can go ahead and get this solved. <laughs> so we, John said, yeah, OK, OK. And you know, how we just, you know, when people say you want to pray, it's like, OK, let's get the prayer over with so we can get to the real stuff. I said, OK, well, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Lord, we asked and we prayed this prayer and slowed down. And then we got back, he got in the thing, and. We, John and I and Harmon, with everything we had in our strength, just pushed and pushed and zzz, this thing, zzz, boom, it explodes out. The Jeep fishtails, whips around and goes up this hill and he drives away from us. <laughs> so now we're, the six of us are in lion country with no protection. I didn't even, you know, I meant how kung fu. <laughs> Don't mess with me, lion. <laughs> so we're sitting there, what are we going to do? He said, well, he went that way. Let's go in that direction. So we just, we walked. And I would say, I wouldn't, is it fair to say a quarter of a mile? Eighth of a mile, quarter of a mile. We walked just wide open. I mean, we can see hippos, and we're out there. And we're in the Garden of Eden, actually. <laughs> so we're walking, and, um, and he had driven up and driven away from the black tar and was waiting for us. And so... I always think of that story because it's so real what happens to us. We, we really don't. Prayer becomes the last resort. Um, I was caring for a bunch of single young men in Georgia. I was their, like a past, lay pastor to them. One of them was 16, a really nice kid, but um, very emotional. He calls me up, and he's just bawling bawling away, going, oh. I said, what happened? He said, well, I have a Martin guitar. Do Martins have 12 strings? I don't think so. Maybe it was a six string, but it was a Martin guitar for you non-guitar aficionados are very expensive. They can cost a lot of money. And he was crying because it had been stolen. And he called me. I was his pastor, just crying. I said, well, Let's pray. That guy, that's not his guitar. That is not, that's not his guitar. That's your guitar. He has no right to steal that. Let's pray, David. His name was David. He said, okay. 
Boom! I just, all I can tell you is the Holy Spirit was an effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. The next day, one of the guys in our church was driving in downtown of this city and saw a guy walking across a crosswalk with that guitar walking into a pawn shop and went and got it and got it back for him. And uh, to this day, I think David knew that God had heard him. He hears your big prayers. He hears, hears your little prayers. Billy Graham said, we are to pray in times of adversity lest we become faithless and unbelieving. We are to pray in times of prosperity lest we become boastful and proud. We are to pray in times of danger lest we become fearful and doubting. We are to pray in times of security lest we become too self-sufficient. He also said that true prayer is neither, uh, uh, the Christian life is not a constant high. He said, I have had moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh God, forgive me and help me. Billy Graham. It's really important to realize that prayer is essentially a conversation with God. Your prayer life, we, t we tend to put everything on pedestals. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of books about prayer. There are people that have had developed whole ministries and do conferences on prayer. Like there's some secret to it. And the disciples didn't know how to pray. They said, teach us to pray. He said, this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a conversation with God. It's a choice. It's the fundamental dynamic that you and I have with Jesus Christ that makes your faith real. If it's not, then you're in a religion. And you come to church, you're part of a church thing, and you look at people, gawk about, and there's some social, you're on the church softball team and it's fun, or you go on a mission trip and it's fun. But that's not what Jesus, it's, it's all about this place each of us have with God. Individual prayer is a private conversation, extraordinarily personal. I have said things to God I've never said to you, even to Dudley. It's confidential, personal, one-on-one. -on -one. Be anxious. Bring up Philippians 4, 6, please. Be anxious for nothing. Man, if we could just do that. If we could just be anxious for nothing. What are we anxious about? I think it's about what's going to happen or what hasn't happened or what may happen or how I'm going to be in the middle of it all. Usually our anxiety is about ourselves. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. Wait a minute. Is that, that must be a misprint. But in most things, everything. That's your geography test, your science lab, everything. Bring God into it by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, not with complaining, not with judgment, but our prayer life is to be full of thanksgiving, overflowing with gratitude, and your requests will be made known to God. Next verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I will have to say, back to the lion thing, not one of us was nervous. No one freaked out. No one said, what are we going to do? It's like there was peace, like a river. And if you know Dudley, you know, she doesn't, doesn't like to fly, doesn't like to do certain things. For her to be that, it, had, it was God just walking through. Would you agree? Yes. By the way, since I'm talking about Dudley, some of you have congratulated us. We, hit a, we had our 50th anniversary this weekend. And had a, we had a great weekend together and so grateful for you. And at one point we were talking, we're going, we did a little memory lane, which we went back to when we lived in a log cabin in Virginia. And 
But I asked her a question. I said, do you feel like we gave her all for the Lord? When she looked at me, she said, yeah, I do. I do. And I'm still working at it. I have to confess every time before I come to church, I don't feel like I've given you my all. I sometimes I think of Private Ryan in the closing scene, or maybe it's the opening scene, closing scene, where he's at uh, Flanders Field in France, I think, and they have all the white graves, and this is about Private Ryan, who so many people were killed saving his life. And now he's like a 75, 80 year old man and he goes by, <clears throat> he goes by the grave and he, he's looking at <clears throat> one of the men that saved his life. They're all dead. And then his wife comes up. She doesn't quite understand him, uh, what he's going through. She tries to, she goes and puts her hand on his shoulder. And then he looks at her and he says, do you think I'm a good man? And she's shocked. She says, well, of course, of course you are. And you know, his kids and grandkids are off in the distance. It really made me think that, uh, <clears throat> so asking that question to Dudley was like, do you think we really have? And we've still got a ways to go, but I will tell you, I have, uh, there are no regrets for a person who gives your heart to Christ. You'll have regrets about a boyfriend. You'll have regrets about a coach or a sport. Or you'll have regrets about violating your conscience, stealing, hurting someone. But I promise you, you won't have any regrets about him. Bring up Mark 135. When it comes to prayer, um, this goes in my life, at least it's seasons, not all the time. And I don't, I'm, when I'm speaking today, I'm not trying to give you a system. I'm trying to impart a reality. You find your own system. If you need a list and write everybody down, if you, if you need to do it every morning at five o'clock and that's the way you do it, that's the way it works for you, then that's good. But Jesus, it says, in the early morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up and he left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Next verse. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said, everybody's looking for you. He said to them, let's go somewhere else to towns nearby so that I can preach there also, for that is what I came for. Jesus' prayer life had intentionality. Prayer was not about comfort or convenience. Prayer with the Father was a priority. Everyone's looking for you. He had a full schedule. If you read the preceding verses, he was up late into the night casting out demons and praying for the sick. He was really tired when he went to bed, got up early. He was in constant demand. The sake of humanity was at stake. He is the redeemer of the world. And he's wasting time in prayer when he should be out healing people, building up the synagogues, making sure that the Israelites are connecting to Rome properly. He withdrew to a private place of prayer. In another part, it says he was so much activity that the disciples didn't even have time to eat. And he told them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while to be with God. Why do we place such a premium on prayer? When we work, we work. Say that with me. When we work, no, you're not saying it. When we work, we work. When God works, 
He works. Prayer is releasing God into the situation. He somehow, in the mystery of his will, harnesses himself to our prayers. He tells us so much about prayer. It's not, you know, he already knows what we need, but he still tells us to ask. Bring up Daniel 10, verse uh, 13, I think. This is a story of Daniel was the great prophet, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kingdom of Persia. And if, I won't read the whole scripture, but it says, Michael, I says, Daniel, you are esteemed in our sight. We have heard your prayers, but it's been a delay of 21 days because there is a battle going on in the heavenlies. You see anything, any battles up there? All I see is a ceiling. There is an unseen battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. Daniel was praying and the prince of Persia, in this case, was like Satan. And there was a battle. Why a delayed 21 days? If you've got the answer, I don't know. You're, you're smarter than most people if you figured it out. All I know is that it wasn't that the prayer wasn't answered. It was just delayed. Your prayers can be delayed doesn't mean they're not. Some, some prayers get delayed years, even decades. He knows the timing for the answers. Prayer is powerful. It's not just for intercessors and specialists. It's sacrificial in nature and requires us to draw close to the Lord. Prayer will bring others to salvation and restore the backslider and strengthen saints. It heals the sick and glorifies his name. He imparts wisdom to us and gives us peace and leads us not into temptation when we pray. Did Jesus call us to preach without ceasing? Did he call us to teach without ceasing? Did he call us to have committee meetings without ceasing? Did he call us to sing without ceasing? No, he called us to pray without ceasing. Did he say my house will be called a house of study, a house of fellowship, a house of music, a house of biblical exposition, a house of activities, a house of political activists? No, he said my house will be called a house of prayer. Our prayer lives begin at home. I cast no aspersions on anybody here, but it still surprises me when I hear that husbands and wives don't pray together. What the heck are you doing? Seriously. Oh, it's too personal. You're married, okay? Pray. Pray, pray, pray. As my son Matthew, every time I give this sermon, I always quote him. I put him to bed one night when he was about nine years old. He had just watched a war movie with Germans, and the Germans were really evil. And so he goes to bed. I said, okay, Matthew, let's pray. He says, Lord. I just pray, 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 pray. I pray, 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 pray. I pray, 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 pray for those Germans that they don't hurt anybody else. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. He got it. An attitude of prayer is to be humble, bold, sincere, loving, persistent, definite, and fervent. And above all, honest. He's not looking for a religious spirit. 
so many times, oh, it's so easy to move into a professional, clergy, clerical, oh God. He's looking for reality. He warned them. He said, some people like to stand on the corners and be seen by men and, and pontificate. No, it's, it's not that. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The early church was a praying church. Before the Holy Spirit fell and all of the 120 spoke in unknown tongues and tongues of fire came down, they were in a prayer meeting, praying. Prayer preceded Pentecost. Prayer precedes our own renewal. If you're dry, if you're distant, if you feel disconnected in some way, shape, or form, bring it to the Lord in prayer. True prayer will heal your heart of bitterness. I love Rhonda Reardon. She's here today over in the corner. We pray together every Tuesday. Rhonda is, works in the political arena. And so often she and I are praying for people that we totally disagree with. And uh, I'm double clutching while I'm doing that. It's really hard to hate someone, you, if not impossible, that you pray for. And by the way, this is not my idea. Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Not just your kids. Pray for them too, but your enemies. So, and bless those that despitefully use you. Bless and curse not. Prayer will shield your heart and my heart as well. Your circumstances may not change, but you will be changed in relationship to your circumstances if you come to the Lord with a greater intentionality about prayer. High schoolers, I want to tell you something right now. This needs to be your faith, not just your parents'. And for that faith to be developed, you've got to have a prayer life yourself. Otherwise, you're just going through the motions, following something, but you won't have any conviction. And in the day of battle, you won't be able to stand. So I'm calling you out, you guys. You know who you are. Be prayer warriors. Pray for your dad. He needs it. Pray for your mom. She needs it. Pray for your siblings. They need it. Pray for your pastor. He definitely needs it. So number one, we, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. Number two, we're to pray without ceasing, but that ceasing is not, um, it's spoken and unspoken. It's a heart and attitude um, looking to the Lord. It's like, I'm married to Dudley, but I'm not with Dudley all the time. So when I'm not with her, I'm not married. No. If you say pray without ceasing, the only time I'm really, I have to keep verbalizing prayer until I pass out. No, it's an attitude of just what I'm saying. If you get stuck in lion country, you pray. If you lose your phone, you pray. If you see someone that um, you drive by, uh, I often pray when I hear a siren. Just pray, Lord, be with those people. And finally, I want to just close with the fact that there are um, deterrents or impediments to you having a prayer life. Number one is, is what I would call unconfessed sin. Sin causes us to pull away from God and a vital relationship, and it it makes us become nominal. If we don't confess our sins, we have to fake it. Or we accept our sin. God loves me the way I am. I say, yes, he does. But you don't love God. Because if you love him, you obey his commandments. That's what he said, not me. 
So confess, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us in our, of our sins and cleanses us. I think Billy Graham's a pretty great guy. How many of you think he was pretty good? He was out there. Countless millions came to Christ. He had like seven decades of preaching. And he just said, I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh, God, forgive me. Help me. Confessing sins is not just because you're an adulterer or you're in, the, you're in you're a killer or you're doing it. it. It's missing the mark. It's keeping our hearts right before God. The second one that will hold you back, I've already mentioned, is satanic activity. If you want more of God, God is a spirit. You must worship him in spirit and truth. The God of this age has blinded the hearts of the unbelieving. That is what the world is about. When you watch the news or see all the stuff going on, you're not hearing much about being humble, meek, come unto me. It's a different world. So the satanic activity is there. Be aware. The devil seeks to dissuade, confuse, and bring chaos. He'll make you feel like your life's falling apart when it's not. Don't believe his lies. He's a liar and a thief and a murderer. Your feelings may be real, but they may not be accurate, and they certainly aren't final. Your feelings are not allowed to be on the throne. God is on the throne. A third one is unbelief. Kevin, I've prayed and God didn't do anything. He says to seek and keep on seeking, ask and keep on asking, knock and keep on knocking until you get tired. He doesn't put any limitations on it. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, unbelief. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea tossed to and fro. Let them expect anything from the Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to, uh, to please God. We must believe that he is and a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I'm a believer. Are you? Are you? Say I'm a believer and ask me if I am. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking. That used to be a song by the monkeys, by the way. For old, never mind, who are the monkeys? And forget it. Um, okay, I got two more and we'll get through this. Uh, domestic problems. How men treat their wives affects their prayer life. A man is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Would you bring up 1 Peter 3? Now, 1 Peter 3, 3, is that it? Go to the next one. Keep going. It's good, good stuff. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, here we are. The Sarah part, you ladies already have down. You husbands, in the same way, as these wonderful women that those of you that are married that God gave you. We're to be in the same way. They're kind to us, we'd be kind back. Live with your wives in an understanding way. What's so hard about that? Hmm. As with someone weaker, uh-oh. I am woman, hear me roar. I am somebody. No, let me tell you. You may be stronger in your spirit, but you can't bench press as much as Shaquille O'Neal, okay? It's talk physical. And you have to understand, in these days, when that was written, a woman could be just apprehended uh, because a man would be physically stronger. 
It's still true, actually. Since she is a woman, and show her honor. That's, that doesn't seem that hard either. The understanding, show honor. What, what am I missing here? And a fellow heir, co-equal. I know I'm the pastor of the church, and I have a, some authority and responsibility that you don't have, but I'm not better than you because I have it. I know I'm the leader of my family, but I'm not better because I'm leading my family. That was just given to me by God. Men, I want to challenge you, too, to lead your family. Many men turn their leadership over to their wives to manage the family, and the wives are managing the family while the husband's not leading the family. Lead your family in the way I'm talking about. So that what? So that your prayers will not be hindered. I don't care how intense you are. I don't care how loud you are. I don't care if you fast. If you don't treat your wife right, your prayers will not go past the ceiling. This is very important to God how you treat your wife when it comes to prayer. Those of you that aren't married or widows or divorcees or going through different things, you can hear what I'm saying in all this. This is, an irrele this is not irrelevant to you. And finally, um, I've got more, but for time's sake, I'll just close with one on forgiveness. So Dudley and I went to see Hamilton. That was what we did for our anniversary date. And if you haven't seen it, how many have seen it? Okay, about a half dozen. Okay, it's the story of Alexander Hamilton, who was one of the founding fathers. And he was raised in the Bahamas. No formal education, but he was brilliant. He just was brilliant. And he, someone noticed how good he was at what he was doing. He was working on the docks. And they sent him to New York so he could get a formal education. He was an immigrant. He was an illegitimate child. And he shows up. And by the eight, time of his 21, he is a personal aide to General Washington. And the story goes on. He was such a prolific writer that he wrote a lot of Washington's correspondence. And the story goes on how um, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, had gone to France during the French Revolution. And so one of the songs in the play is, what did I miss? What did I miss? Because he missed the whole Constitutional Convention and came back. And it ends up Hamilton and Jefferson are, become arch enemies. In fact, I go as far as to say that Hamil Jefferson hated Hamilton as much as Pelosi hates Trump. That'll put it in a perspective. <laughs> they couldn't stand each other. Well, Hamilton worked to the bone. He wrote the Federalist Papers along with James Madison. And he was just prolific in everything he did. And he ended up having to isolate himself to just hunker down. And his wife was at their home. He was in the city. Some woman came to him that needed help. He gave her help, but she seduced him. And he fell. And he had an affair for about a month. And then her husband showed up. This true story was going to extort Hamilton and put it in all the papers. Is that me? My pacemaker's acting up. Hold on. <laughs> I'm getting to a point. He, the story ends with the fact that he's being, um, they're trying to get money out of him. And uh, he finally comes clean. And then Jefferson and Madison use it against him. And he pretty much, that pretty much ruined his chances for presidency. But one of the songs was by his wife. It says, you saved your legacy, but you ruined our family. It's a powerful song. And she's singing. And then the next part of the scene, the, the song moves on. 
And at the end of it, she goes, forgiveness, forgiveness. And the song moves to this thing, kind of the lights go down, but she forgave him. And because she forgave him, their marriage endured. And not long after that, Hamilton was challenged to a duel and with Aaron Burr. And history points it out that Hamilton, you could go to a duel just to show up and that would save your honor and not do anything. But Hamilton went because he was called out. Burr called him out. And he put his gun up in the air like this. He didn't shoot and Burr shot and then he died. And then um, the story is about the founding fathers. Everybody knows about Washington, the Washington Mo Monument, the um, Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial. But what about, what about Alexander Hamilton? who did the National Bank and really got us involved with the other nations with a type of economic strength. His office was on a street called Wall Street that's pretty famous today. And the, the last scene of the play is she comes out again. And so she lived 50 years after he was killed. And she put down all the historical markers so that people would understand about Alexander Hamilton. My point is forgiveness is powerful. If you've been wounded, which if you're alive, you've been wounded. There's great freedom in forgiving, but you may need to really pray it through. Forgive him. He actually even says, don't bring your stuff before the altar if you have ought against somebody. First, go get it right. Maybe some of you need to forgive God because of something that happened to you or your family. It's not fair in your eyes. And maybe some of you need to forgive yourself. Abraham Lincoln said, I know that the Lord's always on the side of right, but it's my constant anxiety and prayer that I and this nation may be on the Lord's side. I want to leave us this morning with the thought that your prayers really count big time. Another song, Slow Down, You're Moving Way Too Fast. Anybody know that song? Who knows that song? How's it go, John? <laughs> Slow down, you're moving way too fast. If you can't you loved Luther, right? Okay, John, John is a Luther aficionado, and Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And Luther actually was quoted as saying, when I'm really busy, I have to go back to three hours of prayer. I'm not kidding. This is it. This is the substance of the substance. You either are going to be a prayer person or you won't be. And if you are, it, it grows in you. It grows in you. And sometimes I feel like I'm having to, you know, charge the battery. I get it. Let's stand.